Okay, so I've talked about incentives uh, somewhat, uh, but I want to go into a little more detail because incentives are so important uh, for uh, decentralized finance. So there are two general types of incentive. Um, one is called a staked incentive. So uh, think of this as you're staking or contributing liquidity uh, to a pool and you get an incentive for actually uh, doing that. So very analogous to um, you know, some reward for uh, providing uh, liquidity. And then there are direct incentives. So, uh, and this is basically, this applies to users within the system that might not be um, having like a, an escrow balance. Okay, so to get people to actually uh, use uh, the system. So uh, these are the two uh, general uh, categories. So uh, a staking reward, again, um, is, is something where you put some money uh, into a pool uh, and you receive a bonus. Think of it that way, uh, based upon the stake that you've actually got uh, in the system. So uh, there's various different ways to, um, to implement this. You might need a minimum balance to actually receive uh, some sort of reward. The reward might be a fixed payout. It might be um, pro rata payout. Um, it might be that the staking reward is the same token as the liquidity pool, or it might be a different token. Uh, it, it might be uh, a governance token. So there's many different ways to actually do this in the DeFi uh, world. So an example of a firm that is a leading firm that we talk about in considerable detail in the third course, a DeFi Deep Dive, is Compound. So Compound Protocol um, is a, a leading protocol. So they have rewards based upon their comp uh, token. So uh, essentially, uh, the comp token has got a fixed supply and there is a reward for stake balances on a pro rata basis. Uh, synthetics, which we also talk about in Deep, uh, deep Dive, um, they've got a uh, SNX uh, token and it, in contrast to comp, has got an technically unlimited supply. Uh, and the rewards are paid out as inflation on the token, and it has got a minimum threshold uh, sort of requirement. So there's many different ways uh, to actually uh, do these uh, incentives, and we explore these in much more detail in DeFi Deep Dive. So the other side is slashing. So slashing is the removal of a portion of the uh, stake balance. Okay, so it might be that that occurs as a, as a result of some undesirable event. And that might be you, uh, you violate your collateralization ratio, something like that. Um, and then there would be some slashing. And the slashing condition. So again, think of the word cloud that I showed you in, uh, at the beginning and the end. Of the, uh, of the first course. This is something that is up there, slashing. Again, we kind of know what it means, but within the world of DeFi, um, a slashing condition is a mechanism that triggers uh, a slashing. So uh, there's many different ways uh, to do uh, slashing. So um, there could be a complete slash which means that everything that you've got is gone, or it could be a, a partial slash. So for example, if you had, uh, if you fell below a collateralization ratio, I've got plenty of examples on this, then it could be a partial uh, slash. And uh, there are many different conditions that would uh, trigger a, a slash. I've mentioned under collateralization, but there could be malicious behavior uh, or 
basically changes in market conditions uh, in terms of volatility or price movements that are basically the causal influence in terms of the slashing of potentially not just one user, but many users' uh, balances. Um, so we will talk about collateralization a lot, uh, especially in the third course. But let me give a tangible example here about what I mean here. So uh, if you've got a situation where you are borrowing and you are essentially over collateralized. So the collateral is crypto, crypto is volatile. So it has to be that you put up more collateral than you're actually borrowing. And you know why would you do that? Well, you need some money, but you don't want to sell the crypto. You think it's going to go up in value, right? So this is just like a mortgage. So with a mortgage, your house is worth far more than a mortgage. So it's kind of the same idea. But there's a mechanism whereby if you drop below your collateralization ratio, so if you had to pledge 150% of your loan in the collateral, but the value of the collateral drops below that, then there's a mechanism to liquidate your loan. Okay, and, and basically there would be a slashing that's involved uh, when that actually happens. There will be somebody that actually does that called a keeper, which we mentioned in the first course, and there would be a fee that actually goes uh, to that keeper. So, it, it, so slashing happens, it's not necessarily uh, a result of doing something nefarious. It's just part of how the system uh, works. So uh, direct rewards, um, and again, keepers, we've talked about uh, already. So direct rewards are incentives um, to, to basically have the protocol work as it should. And you want people involved. Uh, if nobody is involved, then it really isn't working. And you want all of the rules uh, followed very carefully, like the collateralization, and you need uh, some help. Uh, in doing that. And this is important, um, that the, the triggering of a liquidation due to under collateralization, that doesn't happen within the smart contract. That happens externally. So it, it's initiated from an externally owned address and a keeper would actually do that. So people are using algorithms to check to see if there's something that's under collateralized. And as soon as they see that, they'll liquidate and collect their fee. And it happens quickly, but everything is initiated from an externally uh, owned contract. So nothing happens uh, automatically, I hear. Uh, but once it is triggered by an externally owned account, it happens very quickly and very uh, efficiently. So um, there, is a number uh, of applications here in terms of what keepers actually do, the sort of uh, rewards that they get, um, and, uh, and again, this is all triggered uh, externally. So what about these keepers? So we've talked about them a little bit. Um, the keeper can receive a reward in many different ways. So it could be a flat fee, for doing the job. It could be a percentage of the actual action. So it just completely depends upon how uh, the protocol is actually uh, developed. Okay, so uh, it's also possible that there's literally an, like an auction uh, where the keepers are bidding on, uh, on, on the work. So it's very, very market-based. Uh, and very uh, competitive. And again, it's all incentive compatible because this basically keeps the system running as it should be uh, running. And we reward people, we effectively pay people to maintain uh, the system and, and, and those are called uh, the keepers. Um, there's some downside, of course. Uh, if gas prices are really high, 
then it might not make sense for the keeper to actually do the work for smaller uh, sort of balances. So uh, that poses uh, some risk. So as the gas fee is reduced, as I believe it will be uh, reduced, then the system becomes more and more efficient. So this is a very important distinction here. So that high gas fee actually discourages the type of behavior that makes the system efficient. So it is important that that fee is reduced. So, so even if it's a small balance uh, and is under collateralized, it's taken care of. And if the gas fee is too high, then it isn't. So there are some downside. So um, you think about fees, um, these are, are basically funding mechanisms. So again, it can be flat or percentage-based. Um, and it, it basically, this is a way, um, for example, for uh, a stake balance you get rewarded for uh, directly. So it's an incentive to actually uh, provide uh, liquidity. So um, one thing that is kind of important here is that the fees are multi-dimensional. So we talk about a concept like fees, but fees mean many different things. Uh, and one thing to take into account is that uh, while Ethereum and Bitcoin are not really anonymous protocols, they're pretty close to it. So you actually don't know like who is getting the fee. Okay, and, and so basically uh, this is a bit of a, a challenge uh, in terms of how this operates. So the contract is open to anybody. Um, and there is, given that it's algorithmic on the Ethereum of blockchain, everything has to be backed uh, by collateral at this point. Okay, so there's no credit, uh, so to speak, that's uncollateralized with the exception of uh, fla flash loans, we'll, we'll talk about uh, later. So, so again, um, so we use these systems in terms of fees, the penalties also, to kind of enforce the, uh, the proper behavior to incent people on an economic basis, we don't have other mechanisms. Okay, so we don't have the mechanisms of centralized finance um, in terms of uh, you know, reputation and, and things like that in the same way in decentralized finance. So again, uh, it is a challenge, it is a new space, and I expect that there are uh, challenges. So, so again, this is uh, important uh, for us to kind of understand that this space allows us to do things very quickly and easily to incent and to punish without like the rule of law or uh, lawsuits and lawyers and, and things like that. It's algorithmic. And there's so many choices in terms of the way that you actually do it. But the key thing is that given the transparency of the smart contract, you get to see everything. It's there. You know the rules of the game. It's clear. If you go below the collateralization ratio, there'll be some slashing, there'll be liquidation, you get something back, but not everything. It's codified. There's no dispute. It's there. There's no last minute changing of the rules because the rules are encoded in an algorithm. 